us our scripture reading for the day. Today's scripture reading will be from Mark 5, verse 9 to 10. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends, and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. Now he has had compassion on you.
possessed by a, a, a legion of demons. Why? Consequently, they, he couldn't be chained. He had broken those chains many, many times. The thing is about God is that when God comes, there's no power in heaven or earth that can continue to bind you up when the Lord comes to free you. And so in this particular instance, this Jesus comes across there. Now, when, when he comes raving, and this is what he did, this, this demoniac, he came raving out of this cemetery there. And of course, you know, he used to terrify all the people around. So really, they stayed away from the cemetery. They didn't want to go anywhere near it because of this demoniac. I mean, he was like a raving beast more than a human being. And of course, he, uh, he would terrify people. And in fact, when he, when he comes out of here raving at the, at the coming of Jesus and the disciples, the disciples actually, man, they take a step back. But is that what Jesus did? No. Jesus turned around and, and he stood his ground and then he spoke those words, you know, come out of him. He knew the longing of the demoniac's heart. You and I, we wouldn't have known that. We can't read people's minds and people's hearts, but God sees all things. And he knew what the real desire of the demoniac's heart Yes, these demons were ruling over his life, so he had no control over it. Now, it's interesting that there were, there were shepherds not too far off, uh, swine herders actually, you know, and there was a, a herd of swine, some 2,000 swine not too far off. Well, they heard this lunatic when he came raving out of the, the uh, tombs there. Uh, out of this graveyard, this cemetery, and of course, it got their instant attention. I mean, they gave the cemetery a wide, wide berth, but they weren't so far away that they couldn't hear this demoniac and his ravings, and, and so they got all their attention, and lo and behold, they saw the demoniac come raving out there, and then they saw this transformation take place in this demoniac's life, and the next thing you know, well, they run. They stop herding the swine and they run back to the town and, and to those that owned the herd of swine. And uh, they immediately told them all that had just transpired. And so all the townspeople, they come out to see whether, you know, what's happened here. And what do they find? They find the demoniac transformed. He's peaceful. He's in his right mind. And now he's been clothed because obviously I think between the disciples, you know, they must have said, well, you know, can you spare a shirt? Maybe you can spare a pair of pants or something, you know. And, and so between them, they all kind of clothed this here demoniac. And, uh, and he's peaceable. He's in his right mind. Now, something like this in that day really made people afraid. They're like, holy cow, who's, who's got this kind of power and everything? And so their first inclination is, whoa. Well, what, what happened was, when Jesus cast the legion out, what did they do? The legion asked him, well, don't, don't just cast us out into the world. You know, well, no refuge, no place to go, you know. But, but here's a, a herd of swine, you know, cast, uh, suffer us to go into them, and, and we'll be all right. And, and so that's what happened. You know, he went out, the legion, this legion of demons went out of this here demoniac, and they entered the herd of swine. And of course, if you read the story, you find out that as soon as the demons entered the herd of swine, they all went into a frenzy and they ran off the cliff, and apparently it was a high cliff above the sea, and they jumped off and they drowned. So because of this, the townspeople are like, well, now wait a minute. Um, we don't know about this, you know. But please, just leave us. Just, just leave us. Just go, you know, and, and it'll be all right with us. Just go. And so Jesus and the disciples step into the boat, and as they're preparing to go, but well, what's the response of the demoniac? He doesn't want to leave Jesus. 
who wants to follow Jesus. And of course, the demoniac, what did Jesus tell him? Well, our scripture reading for today. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he's had compassion on you. I got to tell you, that is some amazing compassion, some amazing grace. Now, the truth is, we've all just um, celebrated another Thanksgiving Day. Um, and I'm sure that the reason that you celebrated Thanksgiving Day was really because the Lord carried you through another week, another year. And you were very thankful for that, right? I mean, I'm, I'm thankful for it. I know the Lord's carried me through another year. <laughs> and so the second context of where I'm coming from today is what great things the Lord has done for me. Two contexts. The one is the way that God works in our lives and how he wants to deliver us. How he wants us to be sanctified because to be sanctified is to be changed. You know, It's to become holy. Because the Lord has told us in his word, be ye therefore holy, for I am holy. In another place in the Old Testament, he says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So, two contexts. So with that in mind, I'm going to give you another scripture reading. Jeremiah 29, 13, which was already shared. This is why I know that the Lord's leading today because <laughs> it was just used today in, in our um, offertory. Jeremiah 29, 13. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. And verse 13. Then, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me. And I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. See, brothers and sisters, God has a plan for us. And a hope and a future is included in that plan. You know, this life, with all its troubles, its trials, its tribulations, its hardships, its struggles, its difficulties, its challenges, is not all that there is for us. It is not the end. Rather, it's the beginning. But in order for us to get there, to the promised land, we've got to make the preparations here. We've got to put in the effort here. We've got to do the work here. Because God has work for us to do. And that work, we know, is the work of salvation. Now, this in mind, I've told this story before, but, but a good number of you weren't here before when I told this story. And... This is, my story is in the line of how the word, Lord works in our lives to transform our lives and save us. And number two, um, how good the Lord is to us. And I am so thankful. I'm reminded of Job's story. How many of you have read Job? Most of you? Yes. Um, then for those of you who've read Job, you know how Job, at one point, he was assaulted by the enemy of souls, and he sought to destroy him. And the way he did that was he covered him, the enemy of souls, he covered him in boils from the very crown of his head to the very soles of his feet. Now, for those of you who've ever had boils, and I've been one of them, I've had boils, and let me tell you, they're one of the most painful things you'll ever experience in your life. But I was never covered from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. And in that circumstance, Job literally cried out. And he cursed, he cursed the day that he was born. You see, this is the kind of way that the enemy of souls works on and in our lives. 
He works for our destruction. He doesn't want us to be saved. He wants to see us destroyed. But if you've read the story of Job, you know that the Lord has a plan for us. And, you know, he has a plan to prosper us, to give us a hope and a future. Now, when I was a little boy, we didn't, <laughs> we didn't really know the Lord. At the time, my family had moved from Betterton over to Dundalk, Maryland, and made our home there. And I never, never up to that point, I don't ever remember hearing anything about God, even God mentioned. I never had heard that. Um, but um, what happened was a tragedy happened in which my father, he had become a trucker and uh, a transporter and, and he had a load of pipe on he drove. He had a, a semi-tractor trailer rig and he had 40,000 pounds of lead pipe on the trailer. Now he had it chained down and, um, and apparently on this one particular night it was pitch black. You couldn't, there was no light from the moon or anything and he was coming home. And so he hit the, he was on the Beltway going around Baltimore, uh, I think it's 395, and, uh, and he came to his, his uh, yield turn off, and uh, as he turned into that yield and started in there, mind you, he has 40,000 pounds of freight on the trail, not counting the weight of the trailer and the tractor, and as he starts into the yield, all of a sudden, his headlights let me tell you, his headlights back in that day were nothing like they are today. You could have seen much better today than you could back then. But as, as he rounded that yield, lo and behold, all of a sudden he saw that there was a vehicle just stopped right in the middle of the yield. And so my father just hit that brake with all he was worth. He put everything he could into braking. But let me tell you something. When you got that kind of weight behind you, you can't stop on a dime. You can't do it. And so, as he continued to just push with all his might on that brake, you know, trying to stop it with all his worth, well, all of a sudden he heard one just crack. And then a moment, just a moment later, a second crack. And then even faster after that, another crack. Each one of these was one of the chains breaking, literally breaking apart from this load of steel pipe. And all he could think of was that person who was in that car in front of him on that yield and what was going to happen. But then he heard the next thing because the last crack came and that whole load of pipe came shifting and just shot through the back of the cab and literally just sent that cab forward off the rig. And as it did, it reached, it reached a point as it came across where more weight was in front than behind and the, and the load came down. And of course he turned in there in his seat and the load of pipe came down and crushed his ankles and his feet. Crushed every bone in them. Now when they got there and got to my father, of course, they got into the hospital as quickly as they could. And, uh, and a phone call was finally received by my mother. And it's interesting, there are just so many aspects of this that affect the whole picture. And one of those is, is that my father had been telling my mother for some time up to this point, she had to get her driver's license. My mother would not get her driver's license. She was bound to No, no, no. I don't need a driver's license. I'm not going to get my driver's license. I think she was more afraid than anything. And uh, But she was very resistant. And I don't know, for those of you who know my mother, there are a few of you here that knew my mother. My mother, well, she was kind of like the rest of us menches. I'm, I'm one of hers. <laughs> stiff-necked. That's what the Lord tells us. We're stiff-necked. And she had resisted that. Well, she got the phone call. But she just couldn't get there. But I think she managed to get a taxi 
and managed to get there to the hospital. And then, of course, she was informed by the time she got there, they had x-rayed and, and they had determined that every bone in his feet and ankles was totally crushed and really couldn't be saved. And so the reality was that they wanted to amputate my father's feet and ankles um, just shortly below the knee. And my father just flat out them and he told my mother, he, to, he told them, you're not taking off my feet and ankles. You're not, I don't care what you do, you're not taking off my feet and ankles. But they were bound to determine they were going to take them off. So when my mother got there and they told her, they, they, they showed her the x-rays, they told her the status and everything, and they said, now he's got to be operated on. We have to take him and, and, and take his feet and ankles off. And, well, she went in and talked to Dad first, and he told her, he said, Joyce, whatever you do, he said, you do not give them permission to take my feet and ankles off. And so that's what she did. She wouldn't give them permission. So my father's semi-rehabilitation, because my father was never the same after that. Um, they didn't take them off. Nevertheless, they had to do major surgery and it took hours and hours because they were digging out all these pieces of bone to try to get every single piece of bone out. Now, you know, if you look at your ankles, you have on, on either side, you have a, a round bone that comes out. That's, that's the ankle, you know. And... Uh, when my father finally came home and I, I saw his ankles for the first time, my father didn't have those there. He had big, big hollow pits on, on either side. And in the morning time, my father's ankle would start out normal size. It would start out normal size. But as the day went by, as my father continued to try to walk on his feet and ankles, they would grow up until, they would blow up until, really, they were this big around by the end of the day. And they look the worst color you've ever seen. Now this is this sets the stage here because God tells us in Romans 8:28 that He makes all things work together for good. All things work together for good. What is the good that the Lord desires for us? To give us a hope and a future. You see, we didn't know God before that. But as a result of that. My mother began praying to God. She began crying out to God. And I'm telling you, my mother was weeping and praying. And, and I'll be honest with you, us kids, we, look, kids in my day, we were to be seen and not heard. Parents didn't tell you what was going on. You're too, you're too little. You can't possibly. I'm telling you, children are just little people. Yes, they don't have the experience. They don't have the knowledge. But they're just little people, and they, it's amazing what children can understand if you just share it with them. But what I'm saying is, is, as I have one older sister, she's been dead now for 22, 23 years, and, uh, and then I have two younger brothers, and then a baby sister who came 14 years after the last, after the last brother. And, uh, but as a result of this, you see, we all came to know the Lord. But it was, it was a difficult time. In 2 Chronicles 15, 4, it says this. But when in their troubles they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found by them. While as a child, I didn't comprehend what was going on. My mother used to leave my eldest sister with the two younger brothers. The baby sister wasn't born yet. She wasn't born until many years later. Um, she would leave them, and then my mother would take me, and my mother would take me by the hand, and we'd go, and we'd go for these long walks. And, and, and see, I didn't comprehend it back then. I was, I was very young, and I didn't understand. I didn't see the whole picture. But the truth was, my mother, because of the trouble, because of the trials she was going through at the time, this moved her to seek after God. This moved her to seek after God. And so, you know, what she did was, all these trips, and I realize it later, you see, because I can look back and I can see what was going on, what was transpiring. She carried me from church to church to church. We went to the Pentecostal church. We went to the Catholic church. We went to the Baptist. We went to the Methodist, to the Episcopalian, to the Christian scientist. But my mother would always come away from all these churches the same way. She'd come out there. I'd be 
me, had my hand in her hand, and she had her head down, she's just shaking her head, no, no, no. I didn't understand the time. But years later, I understood. You see, she was searching for God. She was crying out to God. But she was looking for him here, and she was looking for him there. Everywhere she could find that she thought he should be found, but she wasn't finding him. And then, as the months dragged on, because my father was in the hospital for 28 months. 28 months. And uh, the doctors had told him that he'd never be able to walk again. He'd never be able to walk again. Well, I'll tell you what, with God, all things are possible. I'm going to tell you right now, if God's in the picture, you might not have bones, but if God's in the picture, you'll still be able to walk. I mean, that's how awesome God is. You see, we, we think in terms of what we understand, and we understand these certain things. Oh, yes, we have bones, and so as long as we got bones, we can, you know, with muscles and tendons and legs, oh, yeah, we can, we can walk, or we can do this or, or that. But listen, with God, hey, you know with God, you don't even need to have breath to live. Oh, that's hard one to accept, isn't it? But with God, all things are possible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's what God says. Now, the next part of my story. What happened next is something quite amazing. Because, like I said, for months, months, my mother was carrying me to these churches and for months, my mother's crying, you know, just weeping. See, I didn't comprehend all the struggle. But you see, without my father on the road making a living, we couldn't pay our bills. I didn't know about all those bills. I didn't comprehend that, you see. It was a much bigger picture, a lot more going on than what I understood at the time, but I've understood it since. And so what happened was, as time goes by, there's less and less resources until there's no resources. And there was no money to buy food with. And so my mother's crying out because she has four children at home. Four mouths, not counting her own. Five with herself. And she didn't even have the resources to buy food. Not only that, but she had received notice after notice in the mail that they were going to foreclose on their mortgage, take their house away from. Well, we'd be out on the street. What was she going to do with four children out on the street? And so my mother is just crying out to the only one that she can call upon who can help, you know? A lot of times we, we, might, we might cry to a parent. Uh, we might cry to a brother or a sister. And oftentimes, how many of them can help us? Not very many. And even if they do have a little help, it's just a little help. It's, it might be enough to buy a, another meal or two, you know, but it's not enough to really feed them long term. You see, and this is what my mother was looking at. This is the reality she was facing, and so she's crying out. And then one day we receive a <coughs> on the back door of the house. And he comes to the front door. I always thought that that was the most peculiar thing. I look back on it, and I'm like, why did they come to the front door? They went to the, we had an alley down, but we lived in row homes. They used to call them row homes. They called them townhouses now. Nice, nice picture, but... Back then they called them row homes, and they had an alley in the back street between this row of homes and the next row of homes, and they came down this alley, and it was a downhill, if you came in from German Hill Avenue over in Dundalk, it, it started up here, and it came down, it was a right good pitch, by the way, but here they came, knock at the back door, my mother says, Dougie, go to the, go to the back door and find out who they are and what they want, and, and send them away, I went to the back door and I opened up the back door, and and there was this gentleman there, and he had the nicest smile on his face, and, and uh, he said, hello. He said, can I, can I help you? I'm like, wait a minute. Um, what? You know, it's like normally somebody comes to your door, they're asking you, you know, hey, won't you let me do this for you? <laughs> you know, they got all kinds of things. And so uh, by that time, my mother had, had come. She had sort of semi-dried off her... Her teary, blubbery face was all puckered up and swollen up, you know, from weeping and everything. And and, uh, and he introduced himself as Mr. McCarthy. I've never forgotten, and I never will forget it. Now, thank God, 
for the McCartneys all these years. I thank God over and over for them because they were an angel. They were angels that were sent to them in his way. And uh, uh, so my mother, as soon as he asked her, as soon as he asked her, what, oh, is there something, what can I do for to help you, you know? Oh, my mother just broke down, she couldn't hold back the tears, you know? And uh, so she proceeded to blub her out, you know, their, father, their husband's in the hospital and she's got no food and they got, oh, just hold on, just, just give us 30, maybe 35 minutes and we'll be right back. And so this gentleman and his wife, you know, walked walk down the sidewalk and down the steps, down into the back alley and got in their cars and they drove off. You know, a lot of times people say they're going to do things and then you, you never hear back from them again. I mean, let's face it, if they find out they can't do much, a lot of people won't come back because simply they're embarrassed. They can't really do anything, you know. But this brother and this sister, let me tell you something, they came back in about 35 minutes. And uh, we had what's called a galley kitchen in, in our house. It just just wide enough. In fact, there, on, on the one wall in the kitchen, there was a little fold-up table. You undid these latches, and it would fold down and lay against the wall. And then when you needed to use it, you just reached down, and you grabbed it and pulled it up, and it would lock. It would lock in place. Well, I'll tell you what. They filled up that that table till there, there, it, you just couldn't have no more food on top of it. And then they filled up the floor underneath of the table. And then we had a bank, a four foot, four foot bank of cabinets on the wall with a four foot bank, which three foot was the kitchen sink. And, and it had some pots and pans and everything down. There wasn't a whole lot of room in either one of them because you had dishes up top and pots and pans down in the bottom. But a little bit of room. Had a little bit. Well, they filled up inside there too. Couldn't have got nothing else in the cabinets. And then my father, before the accident, he had built shelves down down the basement on the walls down there. Well, there was nothing on the shelves. But when they got done, the shelves were just full. You just couldn't have got nothing else on the shelves. I will never forget it till the day I die. You know. And I have thanked God for this day over and over in the course of my life. And then when they'd done all that. Then he turned around and he and, and he said, I'm, I'm Mr. McCartney. He said, what's, what's your name? And my mother told him, oh, my name is Joyce Lynch. And he said, well, Joyce, what else can I do to you? Oh, my goodness. My mother just burst out in tears and started blubbering again. And she told him about how, you know, the accident, the accident that had happened with dad and, and his situation and how it was going to be a long time. We didn't know when he'd be coming back and what kind of condition he'd be in. And and they were getting ready to take us, take our home away. You know what he said? Oh, don't worry, Joyce. I'll tell you what. Tomorrow morning, you be ready by 9 o'clock. I'll be here to pick you up. And he said, and I'll take you to your mortgage broker. And I will pay all your past mortgage all the way up. And then until your husband gets back home every month, I will pay, pay your mortgage payment. Until until your husband gets back on his feet. Now, brothers and sisters, that is an enormous, an enormous commitment. If it was anybody else but God, I would say, no, nah, that's, that's not possible. You know? Well, with God, all things are possible, Romans 8, 28. In fact, in Philippians 4, 19, we read this, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You see, I'm telling you right now, when you seek after the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, His promise is that you'll, then you'll find Him. You'll find Him. And boy, when you find God, oh my land, that mercy, you find, you'll find everything that you need because He supplies all our needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And so, of course, as soon as he told her, oh, my mother just burst down weeping. I mean, can you imagine the relief? Can you imagine the relief? And of course, she was inclined to believe this fellow because, I mean, look at look at the table. Look underneath of the table. Look at, look at what's in the canvas. Now, look at their shelves. Now, boy, he had fulfilled his word. He had fulfilled his word. And sure enough, the next morning, he did show up. And he did take her to the mortgage broker, and he paid all their past 
And I think at that point, it was one year. It was 12 months worth of payments that she had not been able to pay. And he had paid that all up. And then from that point on, I know for a fact that he continued to pay the mortgage until... Now, when he brought her back home after seeing the mortgage agent and getting all this straightened out so she wasn't going to lose her home, then he turned around and he asked her, now, Joyce, he said, is there anything else I can do for you? And he said, Joyce, would you like to know God? What do you think my mother's response was? <laughs> oh, you can believe it. Oh, yes, I want to know God. I've been crying out to God, and God is <laughs> my parents. Surely he must be. And so they made an appointment, you see, to, to share with my father the gospel according to Jesus Christ. And so, sure enough, he came back on that appointment, and he had a nice little uh, tripod with a screen and set, set the tripod up and set the screen up and he had a nice little slide projector there and, uh, and he sat down and, 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 uh, and he started to share with my mother. Well, you see, all this time, man, I might not have understood all what was going on, but when I heard about God and when I saw what this fella did, him and his wife for my mother. You know, I wanted to know about God. I wanted to know about this God who answers prayer. And so I crept there. My mother told us, you, you just, all, you know, the, talking to the four of us kids, you know, you, you just get up there and you go in bed and you be quiet. I don't want to hear a sound out of you, you know. And I crept down the steps. Uh, we come about halfway down the staircase and then the wall would open up. And so I crept about just about to the corner. I'd creep down the steps and I would sit down on the step and I would listen. And then a marvelous thing happened because when he turned on that slide projector and then he started showing slides, well, everything came through the screen onto the back wall of the steps there. And I'm sitting on the steps and it comes through on the wall of the steps and I'm seeing the pictures. <laughs> and somehow, my, I have no idea how, you know, but I guess she could hear church mouse. Dougie, is that you on those steps? I don't know how she knew. You know, it wasn't the others. It wasn't my sister. It wasn't my two brothers. You know, it was me. Dougie, are you down those steps? He goes, ma'am, I'm down those steps. You know. Didn't I tell you? You better get up there. Don't be making a sound. Don't you come back down here again. So I waited for a couple minutes. I was listening the whole time. And then, as he went on with the study, I couldn't help myself. I was drawn. You see, I was drawn back down. You know, Jesus said in his word that no man cometh unto me except the Father first draws him. Who do you think was drawing me down those steps? It was the Father drawing me. He wanted me to hear the good news. God's salvation. I was only six years old. <laughs> the best day of my life when they came to our door. <laughs> the very best day of my life. And I praise the Lord for sending his servants that day because it was right on time. It was the perfect time. It was the time when it would make the greatest impression. And it's lasted me my whole life. And so I heard this gospel. Well, I, needless to say, I got caught a second time. And then the third time it happened, then he spoke up after my mother was berating me and telling me what she was going to do to me afterwards. <laughs> and he said, Joyce, Mr. McCartney said to my mother, he said, Joyce, you want to hear about the Lord. You want to know about your heavenly father, right? And my mother said, well, yes. And he said, but don't you think he wants to hear about him or needs to hear about him? Oh, well, yes, I, I do think about it. Don't you, you want to hear about the Lord? <laughs> And I said, yes, mother. And so she says, all right, you come on down here. But you sit down and you be quiet. And I was very quiet. And I came down and I sat down there. And I think we had like, I don't know, 35, 40 lessons. Week after week after week he came. In that time, we got to know the McCartney very well. Very, very loving people. I think they were angels in disguise. 
Because they look just like human beings, just like you and I look, you know. And uh, they invite us to their home many times. And when we come, they break out with the apples and the popcorn. <laughs> and it was a great experience. You know, in Psalms chapter 23, verses 2 and 3, it says, He leads me beside the still waters. You ever been led beside the still waters? So peaceful. When God leads you, he leads you beside still waters. It's peaceful. It says he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Who is his name's sake? We're talking here about the Father. And who's his name's sake? Jesus Christ. You see, it's for Jesus Christ's sake. Why? Because God so loved the world. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you right now, that is all-inclusive. It doesn't leave a single soul out of the equation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. In Psalms 25, verses 4 and 5, it says, Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Brothers and sisters, God answered my mother's call. When in troubles and trials she cried out after the Lord, she sought after the Lord with all her heart, with all her mind, with all her soul, with all her strength. God answered her. And he answered it in a powerful way, an undeniable way. You just can't deny God's answer. Because I've never known anybody else to do such a thing. In 2 Peter 3, 9 it says, the Lord is not all should come to repentance. God wants you. God wants you to, to save you. He doesn't want to destroy you. God loves you. So much so that he gave his only begotten son. He doesn't want you to perish. He wants to save you. And he wants to give you a hope and a future. And brothers and sisters, the future that he's designed for us, there's nothing in this world that's worthy to be compared to it. Nothing. And so my closing verse here is Acts, the 20th chapter, verses, verse 32. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those that are being sanctified. Brothers and sisters, God wants to prepare you for a kingdom to come that will have no end. A kingdom in which you won't grow old or weary or worn out like I am or broken like I am. Or in afflicted, like so many of us are, with afflictions. You know? But he's got to, he wants to give us an inheritance that's going to be everlasting. An inheritance that's going to be so incredible, you will never cease overflowing with joy and praise to him who's going to provide it all. Because it's a kingdom that will never end. And you'll have no death. All that's been cast into the lake of fire and burned up in and ended, you know, it's a it's a life. There's nothing in this world, a world is worthy to be compared with. I know that God lives, and I know that He's able, able to save us unto the uttermost. But we've got to take heed to His word. And brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you right now: the time is growing short. All the things that God has told us in his word that he told us to watch 
And know that when ye see these things fulfilled, the end is near. Even at the doors, brothers and sisters, they are being fulfilled every single day out here. And so watch and pray. And in all things, in all things, give thanks unto the Lord. For this is the whole duty of man. You see, God is sovereign, and I'm telling you right now that when when God wants to intervene, he's able to rule every trouble, every trial, every tribulation and make them work together for your good. So brothers and sisters, I commend you to God and to his word, which is able to make you wise unto salvation. Glorify him. Our closing song today is page 321. My Jesus, I love you. Jesus' name.